the reality of the situation is these bills are being introduced at such a rate that other politicians might not even be able to keep up with all of the different ways in which trans rights are trying to be suppressed. And whenever the GOP gets a win where minors are concerned, they then move on to talking about adults. To Okay, guys, we got to talk. We got to talk. We've gone over a lot of the restrictions that have happened uh, in regards to trans affirming health care, gender affirming health care, uh, and a lot of the, just the terrible stuff that has happened in the political sphere recently, uh, including that one time that I, I faked everybody out and it was just about porn. Ignoring that time, we do need to talk about some stuff that's happened recently. A lot of it that happened while I was gone. Let's get into that. But first, let's go ahead and get into the fan art section. First one we have here is from Gideon Wells. Had a stray thought on extrapolation that I wanted to stretch, uh, sketch out. Slime cat to slime person to necro slime answer? This on a long enough time scale. Huh. Okay, then. The next one we have here is from uh, LaDaniel Wolfkin. I finished the Volcano Chan drawing from the last YouTube stream. Hope you enjoy it. Even 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 the volcano gets boobies. Nothing in this chat is safe. As always, everybody, thank you all for your fan art submissions. If you want your fan art to be shown in a future video, the best way to do so is to drop it into the fan art section of the Discord. With that all said, let's go ahead and get right into today's topic. So, GOP lawmakers are expanding gender-affirming care restrictions to adults because, of course, even though we've been told repeatedly that, hey, this is just a way to protect kids. This is just a way to protect people uh, who are minors who may not know any better uh, from receiving gender affirming care because they don't know if that's what they really want yet. Despite those being the things that we have seen and been told repeatedly from GOP pundits, politicians, and their apologists that happen to just binge watch Fox News all the time, Turns out that's not really what's happening. Turns out <laughs> it's always a lie. When human rights are being taken away from one group, it never actually stops. Now you can say, hey, that's actually a slippery slope fallacy, but no way. Slippery slope fallacy is when you and I agree on a set of statements and I say, when will it ever end? When will the stopping point be? A slippery slope fallacy is when I claim that something will necessarily, without any proof, always lead to more of that thing. It's not a slippery slope fallacy when we actually have historical precedent for something. And even if it is fallacious, let's go ahead and point out that even when something is fallacious, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is 100% not true. This is what the fallacy fallacy is for. You can say something that is true. You can say a series of logical progressions that will happen, and it could be a slippery slope and be fallacious and still be what actually happens. That's what the fallacy fallacy is for. Getting all that out of the way, because I know that with the type of audience that I've cultivated, there's a lot of people who will call me out on utilizing fallacies where I will. Understandable. I get that. I'm just going to cover my ass there. And let's go ahead and get into the actual text here. So, state efforts to restrict gender-affirming care are moving beyond trans youth and increasingly are focused on patients who are over the age of 18. Legislators in Kansas, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and Texas have introduced bills barring health providers from offering care such as hormone treatments or surgery to people as old as 26. Holy fucking shit. Now, I can tell you why this is probably happening, the argument is going to be that, oh, well, the human brain isn't done developing until you are 25 in most cases. So it should be about 26 when we start allowing people to get gender affirming care. That would be the basis for that argument if I were to steel man it. But it's kind of idiotic. Most people who are trans realize they're trans early on in life, and it shouldn't be brain development 
ending when we decide to allow people to do certain things. It should be when they are legal adult that we should allow people to do certain things or when they are considered responsible enough in the adult world. This is why we do things like, oh, I don't know, allow people who are 16 years old to get driver's licenses. We recognize there is a point, arbitrary as it may be, where we have to start allowing people to start taking measures that, yeah, sometimes may have long-term side effects, but are measures for their own lives. It's not the worst thing in the world to allow somebody to do that so that they can engage in the learning experiences. But let's go ahead and continue. In contrast to past messaging around protecting children, some proponents of the latest proposals portray gender-affirming care as a business that is exploiting people in need of psychological care. Quote, We think that gender-affirming care is bad medicine and that it's consumer fraud, said Terry Schilling, president of the conservative group American Principles Project, which works with lawmakers to introduce anti-trans measures. We don't believe that men can change into women based off removing body parts or changing our hormone makeup. Let's ignore the fact that hormone makeup is literally the thing that by and large makes us experience life as a man or woman. You may not agree with that, but the hormone wash that our bodies go through are largely responsible for the aesthetic changes, the changes in bone structure, the changes in most of the things and the feelings that we have that we associate with gender. There are very specific things that are different between the two sexes specifically that don't really necessarily change because they happen early on in your first puberty. But that's not to say that, again, hormones by and large are responsible for the majority of biological differences between men and women. The only other major biological difference that we would typically look at would be gametes, but Gamete sizes and how they relate to sperm or egg production largely is a thing that goes unseen by most people and is not a huge part of most of our experiences outside of specific situations, like when we're having sex or when periods are happening, things like that. Even then, hormone wash is responsible for a lot of the different cramps and other negative experiences associated with womenhood. I, I, I hate to tell you guys this, but realistically, the hormones are the thing. Forrest Valkai did a wonderful video called Sex and Sensibility that went into the majority of this. If you want a good breakdown, go look at his video. Their video does a much better job than I ever could do in explaining the way our bodies react to various hormones. But if you want just a couple of very brief things, take somebody who is born female, somebody who's assigned female at birth, Take that person and give them testosterone and over a long enough period of time, and you'll notice that little things that we might not consider start to change in their body. Facial hair starts to grow, the clitoris starts to become engorged and becomes closer to what we would assume a penis looks like. Things like that tend to change in the body. And likewise, estrogen can cause shrinking of the same genital areas and also will affect the way that our bodies distribute fat, can cause the growth of breast tissue and things like that. Again, all of these things that we consider part of the male and female experiences by default, a lot of them are just affected by hormones. It's just kind of how it tends to work. And we don't, a lot of times we don't want to acknowledge that because the hormones are a thing. The hormones are a thing that we don't tend to think about when we're looking at people. We don't think about the chemical makeup of their bodies. We just think about how they look as a person, phenotypically. But let's go ahead and continue on the article itself. Matt Sharp, senior counsel for the conservative advocacy group Alliance Defending Freedom, said that while his organization is focused on bills restricting care for minors, gender-affirming care for adults is not something that we ought to be encouraging or supporting. Instead, patients should be getting mental health treatments like psychotherapy which is another way for them to say, oh, by the way, maybe conversion therapy is what we should be looking for. Gender affirming care advocates say the efforts are proof anti-trans lawmakers want to block all access to those services, not just restrict care for minors. Said so this will always be something, uh, this will always be a long-term plan of trying to eliminate all access to care, all visibility and safety for trans people of all ages. This is something that was said by uh, Milo Englehart, staff attorney at the Transgender Law Center. 
This month, Texas State Representative Tony Tinderholt introduced HB 4574, which states that a health professional who provides gender-affirming care to a trans person under 26 or even refers a patient to another provider could be sentenced to jail and lose their medical license. A similar bill was introduced in Oklahoma in January, but the bill's author ended up lowering the age limit to 18 following intense backlash from LGBTQ advocates. The bills in Kansas, Oklahoma, and South Carolina look to ban health care for trans people under 21. And these measures come on top of others in several states that would allow adults to file malpractice suits against providers who perform gender affirming care. Now, this is not something that we can ignore, right? This is something that should mean that you should be writing to your state legislature, your House of Representatives, uh, especially in Texas, because it was a House bill that was uh, introduced, uh, your state senators. You should be writing into these people and protesting and trying to communicate near their offices. Go where they work. Go where they operate. Go where they will see you. Because this shit is bullshit. Quite frankly, Hold on, I need to see why that message was deleted. Or I don't get to see why that message was deleted because it... Hold on. America is not... Okay, it was America is not land of the free... Why was that message deleted? That's weird. Anyway, it should be noted that when we are looking at these bills that are coming out... I've, I've said it before and I'll say it multiple times going forward... We have so many more bills than we do even days in the year. And I know that's a bit of rhetoric that people are tired of hearing, but it's honestly true. The reality of the situation is these bills are being introduced at such a rate that other politicians might not even be able to keep up with all of the different ways in which trans rights are trying to be suppressed. And whenever the GOP gets a win where minors are concerned, they then move on to talking about adults, despite these being, <sighs> despite the types of hormone replacement therapy and, quote, psychotherapy that the medical industry actually should be pushing for are not the ones that the GOP wants. The GOP wants a blocking of hormone therapy to the majority of the American populace. They would prefer psychotherapy to emulate something more like conversion therapy, where they try to convince people that, no, 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 you're not actually trans. You're actually just you, and you are a person who are experiencing uh, terrible, terrible things that need to be fixed with conversion. You're, don't worry, you're not really gay, you're just confused and straight. Don't worry, you're not really trans, you're just confused and cis. This is the rhetoric that you've probably heard from parental figures, from uh, concerned friends that happen to just follow this stuff uh, in little, little bits in the American news cycle. But don't worry, gender-affirming care is endorsed by actual medical groups, including the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, and the World Health Organization. The lawmakers who have introduced bills with the 20, uh, age 26 as the age limit have said it's because the brain isn't fully developed until the age of 25, an assertion that health experts say is misleading. Again, I told you that would probably be the argument that they would use. While most individuals' brains continue to develop until around the age of 25, the idea of having to wait until then to make a healthcare-related decision seems pretty absurd, says Michael Hendricks, a clinical psychologist who specializes in transgender issues. This is a really good indication of an instance of misuse of science, he says, noting providers already evaluate candidates for gender-affirming procedures to make sure that they're exercising sound judgment before going through with any gender-affirming treatment. Some state bills that ban healthcare for trans youth also have clauses that prohibit public funds from being used in gender-affirming care and bar private health insurers from covering treatments, a move that legal experts say is sex uh, essentially are de facto bans for trans adults as well. These are the types of things that the GOP will use as an attempt to hide behind plausible deniability. Oh, don't worry, we're not actually banning trans health care. We just don't think that public funds and Funds that have been pulled by multiple people should be used uh, for these operations. That includes insurance. We think instead that if you want to make a change to your body, like something like a tattoo, you should be the one that pays for it, not to the general public. That's the argument. That's what they're trying to do. This means that if you happen to be trans and poor, 
fuck you. You don't get help. If you happen to be trans and on medical insurance and are able to afford it, fuck you. You don't get your health care either. Regardless of the situation, the goal is largely clear. The punditry and the lawmakers in the GOP want to make it so that trans people are, by and large, eliminated from society in one way, shape, or form. Even if they are not willing to go to the full ninth stage of genocide, where trans people would be eliminated with violence, they can effectively eliminate the idea of trans people by eliminating their care and making it socially stigmatized for them to walk out and exist as themselves. Think of it this way. If all trans people in the United States were unable to receive hormone replacement therapy and were unable to receive trans affirming surgeries and were socially stigmatized from wearing the outfits associated with the gender that they ex uh, they believe they are not the gender they were born as and assigned as then effectively the gop will have banned being trans in the united states de facto not necessarily de jure this is the same type of strategy the GOP have tried to use with homelessness. Instead of actually trying to solve the problem of homelessness, they would rather spend time eliminating homeless people in certain areas of cities. Make it to where people who live in certain areas of cities or live in certain areas of towns do not have to see or experience the homeless population, and therefore it feels like they solved the problem of homelessness, when really all they've done is scooted them to a tent city somewhere. They never actually solve any of those problems, they just kind of scoot them to the left out of public eye. This is the same thing they're trying to do with trans people. Also, Anubian says, I'd argue that forced medicinal detransition uh, is violence. Anubian, I can, I can agree with that, but nobody, and I mean nobody, who follows a GOP platform or follows GOP politics is going to agree with that. Not a single one of them. And the reason that matters is it does not matter if we are correct. It matters if we are convincing. I agree with you that is a form of violence. Just like I agree with you and I can agree that starving people is a form of violence. But getting somebody who is on the opposite side of the political uh, spectrum from you to agree with that is going to be very, very difficult. So you need to use language that someone on that side is going to understand, someone on that side is going to agree with, because you don't need to convince me. You don't need to convince most of the people in this chat. You need to convince them, which means you need to use their language. The language that largely changes the mind of somebody who is on the GOP side of things is language that emulates ideals like maximum freedom for people or maximum autonomy for individuals. Those are arguments that they will listen to because those are arguments that they will use for themselves. Arguments like this is actually technically violence are more academic and therefore not really something they care about. And I hate that that's the case because when I agree that, yeah, this is violence being enacted on a group of people, when I agree with that, all I can think of in the back of my head is, but the person that needs to hear that won't listen to me because I've used that language. And I hate that. And I don't want that to be the case. I would hope that we could all work with a universal language together that everybody agrees with and understands. When we, when we have these conversations, if we're having these conversations with people who functionally speak a different language than us, then we don't really get that option. We have to go to them and talk to them with the words that they will understand. They'll understand things like freedom for people. They'll understand things like autonomy for adults. They'll understand things like medical intervention is sometimes necessary even for children. They won't understand forced detransition as violence because in their mind, they see it as a medical intervention. Become anarchist, abolish the states. Oh, wait, uh, you won't do that. Will you have a Republican? Well, and you... Bitter pill to swallow, you can't abolish the state. You can't. As long as there are people existing in a community, in a geographical location, you have a state, per every definition. As a trans person, the idea of having to water down language to make fascists more comfortable is important to me. And you know what, Caleb? 
I agree with you. That idea is a hard pill to swallow, and I don't like it either. But I've spent enough time in conservative circles talking with conservative people existing in those spaces to know that I cannot use the language of the proletariat with them all the time. Because revolutionary language, language of, of proletarianism, uh, language of unity and gender positivity, this type of language does not convince them. Our family, I didn't even define a state. A state is just any politically organized body of people occupying a definite territory. Guess what? That's basically what I said, our family. If, if you want to be the, the little anarchity over there that says I'm wrong, I apologize, but that is the definition of a state. Sorry. I don't give a shit how many times you, sp you type in all caps. I've played this game long enough. That's not the definition. That's not the definition. Screech all you want. I'm ignoring you now. I don't give a shit. Is it not more effective to ensure conservatives just don't have position of power? Right. So how would you how would you make that happen, Cat Bingo? Be wrong and ignorant. At least I can spell ignorant, our family. Cat Bingo, for us to create a world where conservatives don't have any power, we have to basically abandon democracy. We have, we have to abandon that. Since that's not really an option in most cases, we have to go for the next best thing, convincing people on the ground that are conservative to vote against conservatives. That's what we have to do. And we have to make sure that people who are on the left that try to do things like vote third party, or at least in the United States, this is not the same case everywhere, everywhere else, but at least in the United States, voting third party does not help out leftist causes. The 5% thing, it still does not help out most leftist causes because most people on the right aren't doing that shit. Unfortunately, we are stuck in a position where the Democrats are the lesser of two evils. So we have to argue in terms of electoralism here in the States. That's what we got. So I think our family is a tad loony. I think so too. I think so, too. Oh, we're talking about the person named our family. Oh, I'm, I'm already ignoring that. Talking to your friends, talking to your family, talking to the people around you who matter to you, and explaining to them that you and your life matters, and there are politicians that want to take that away from you, that can have a measured effect if enough of us do it. Going to the act going to the actual places that your politicians work at and protesting in front of their places, or even just going in and communicating your needs directly to those politicians, those are things that can help you. I, I, I've, I've, I made it a point to talk about this earlier uh, when Marjorie Taylor Greene was running against Marcus Flowers. The office of Marcus, when he was on his campaign trail, was public knowledge. I, I went to his office to talk with him. It's a thing you can do. Politicians are not as out of your reach as you think they are most of the time. The Violet Citadel is not so far off that you can't go there and advocate for yourself. It's not a perfect system. It's a broken system. But when all you've got access to are the tools around you, then those are the tools you got to use. Can we talk about sentient corn dildos instead of uh, letting that family person waffle on idiotically? <laughs> Lunar Rose says, I just looked up the definition with a quick Google search, and it shows that Cirrus nearly quoted the provided definition. Jesus Christ, almost as if I've I've looked at this shit before. Weird. Said the state definition is the monopoly on legitimate physical violence by a centralized organization. Our family, what kind of... So, I'm, I'm just going to say this right now. I do not agree that the state should have a monopoly on violence. But I feel like that's not the definition of state. That's just a thing that is a side effect of having a state with political power. Or rather, more accurately, a government. Because when we say the state, we never fucking mean the state. We mean a government. 
a government is not a state. They are two separate things. You can have a state with no government, but you can't have a government without a state. Right, our family? I agree, state does not equal government. I'm saying you're conflating the definitions. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I was supposed to be ignoring you. Um, that sounds like a far-left, hyper-liberal definition to make enemies. Yeah, again, it's almost as if the language we use is important in these conversations. I, what, weird. It's almost like I, I mentioned that in this conversation. You can be the farthest left socialist in the world, but if you're going to get somebody who is a capitalist to agree with things like organizing unions, you're going to have to start arguing with their fucking language not yours, because your language convinces you and the people who already think like you, but those aren't the people you need to be moving to your side. And it's weird that that's how human beings operate, except it's not weird. Because you know that if you recognize language that is for fascists being used to convince you, you would immediately walk away from it. Almost as if they have to engage in a same level of subterfuge in order to convince you. Pretty sure arguing over definitions is a, is a distraction technique my parents are too damn fond of. Yep, it is. It is. But back to the topic at hand. Back to the topic at hand. So, restrictions into what purports to be bans on gender-affirming care only for minors never functions that, that way. It's for many folks. We see it as an attempt to ban care for really everyone, said Harper Selden, a staff attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union. LGBTQ and HIV project. Bills that block the use of public funds are susceptible to a broad reading, meaning that a hospital or entity that receives state funds for any reason, perhaps, could not provide gender affirming care, even if the care itself is only paid for with private funding. So, to wrap that up, to make that make a quick bit of sense for everybody, that's basically saying that. If a ban comes in legal form to gender affirming care that is publicly funded or funded by insurance companies, the ban is typically going to be worded in such a way that it is so broad that any entity that receives public funding, which will include most hospitals, those entities cannot provide gender affirming care because they are publicly funded. Even if you save up however many thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars are required for your surgery, for your hormones, for everything, even in the magical world where you manage that, those hospitals can still be held liable for trying to provide that care, depending on the way the bills are worded. And some of these bills are in fact worded that way. Oklahoma and Florida are quickly advancing bills to ban health care for minors that also prohibit uh, coverage of gender transition treatments for any person regardless of age. Arkansas has a law in its book that encourages health plans to not cover this type of care, but it's currently blocked. And you know how you stop that blockage? The Supreme Court, which currently leads very conservative. Florida's bills, uh, Florida's bill adds restrictions for adults seeking gender affirming care, such as requiring a patient to submit a written consent form to their provider each time they meet for an appointment. Bills that create insurance coverage regulate uh, regulations and add restrictions are more likely to become enacted than outright adult bans, said Catherine Oakley, state legislative director and senior counsel of the Human Rights Campaign. However, Oakley added that anti-trans bills have been getting increasingly more restrictive over the years, and bans with increasing age limits are a continuation of that trend. So, what this means is, by and large... Every single inch that the GOP is getting, they are not necessarily taking a mile. They are simply taking the next inch, and then the next inch. The goal is to eventually have that mile. The goal is to eventually have a full-on ban on everything trans-related. I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I believe that the GOP strategy will largely be one of not trying to enact stage nine of a genocide. Their goal by and large, is going to be to try to push and push and push the slow torture of the trans populace in the United States, because in that strategy is plausible deniability. In that strategy is the ability to continue to harm people without ever being held accountable for their actions. You get Nuremberg trials when you actually engage in stage nine, but by constantly towing that line, they get to cause all of the harm that they're largely trying to enact 
without any of the plausible or without any of the actual repercussions that could come as a result. Could we call it something akin to a cultural stage nine? No, I think the I think the appropriate thing is to say that they are they are towing the line. Stage nine is the point of no return. We it does not need to be at stage nine to be a genocide. It just needs to be far enough along. And, I mean, it's it's inarguable we've gone through four stages, and it is arguable we've gone through eight stages. What about adding seats to the Supreme Court? If Biden had the balls to do that, he would have done it already. Said it's a passive genocide. Functionally, that's what it is. And especially with trans suicide rates being what they are, you can guarantee that the GOP are looking at that and saying, oh, if we just continue to make the world a worse place for trans people, then they'll just eliminate themselves. I guarantee you that thought has crossed at least one of their minds, potentially more. But that's where I'm going to be ending that particular topic off for now. I know it's a grim one. It's not one that's fun to think about, but it is the state of things as we sit right now. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you haven't already. All that other terrible stuff and fun stuff. But we're going to move on to the next topic here in a second. What I will say, though, is please keep safe. As I've said in many other videos before, the best way, aside from political activism, the best way outside of straight-up activism that you can spite these people is by existing as happy. Spending your time being happy, spending time with your loved ones, existing out publicly as yourself, smiling, that is one of the best ways to spite and hurt the GOP. Again, barring political activism. Political activism is definitely more effective, but existing as something they don't want you to be is certainly effective as well, because if enough of you do, then it becomes more normalized in society, irrespective of what the GOP tries to do. As always, everybody, insert end of video tagline here.